It is Tuesday morning on the 21st of November, 1939, on board HMS Belfast, a new town-class cruiser that had been commissioned just 15 weeks before. She was crewed by regular sailors, under the command of Captain George Scott, who was a career officer and was previously a notable destroyer captain. Scott had demonstrated his skill as a captain to his crew when he maneuvered the cruiser through the hazardous Pentland Firth during an exercise. But now, on this lovely sunny morning, as the crew was going about their daily duties and Belfast was passing under the Firth of Forth Bridge in the wake of the cruiser HMS Southampton, as the ships were to carry out gunnery exercises in the open waters outside the Firth, along with a tug crewman who was to tow a target and two destroyers, soon after maneuvering to follow Southampton, Belfast struck a magnetic mine that would cause her to be out of action for quite some time. Belfast commissioned on the 5th of August 1939, a little under a month before Germany invaded Poland. In August, she participated in the exercise I briefly mentioned in the introduction, where she played the role of a German commerce raider and successfully evaded the home fleet in the Pentland Firth. She also participated in a patrol between the Shetlands and Norway that was to prevent a German breakout into the Atlantic in the event of war. The force included the battleships Nelson, Rodney, Royal Oak, and Royal Sovereign, the battlecruisers Repulse and Hood, along with the aircraft carrier Ark Royal. Three cruisers, 17 destroyers, and seven minesweepers accompanied the larger vessels. With the German invasion of Poland on September 1st and war breaking out several days later between Germany and the Allies, Belfast continued her patrols and drills. Some notable events during her time here was taking part in the operation to recover the submarine Spearfish, where she was attacked by aircraft but suffered no damage, as well as intercepting several vessels in the months of September and October. She was also one of the ships in Scapa Flow when the battleship Royal Oak was torpedoed by U-47. In early November, Belfast was ordered to the 2nd Cruiser Squadron as a striking force in the North Sea. Somewhat akin to the Heritage Force in the First World War, or based off distance, more like the battlecruiser squadron stationed in the Firth of Forth. On the 11th in company with Southampton, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aurora, and a destroyer flotilla, they went south to sweep for mines along the east coast of the United Kingdom, returning to Ross Scythe on the 17th of November. Several days later, on the 21st of November at 9.17 a.m., Belfast began making her way through the Firth of Forth. The morning and the preceding events are captured in the last big gun at War and Sea with HMS Belfast by Brian Lavery. It was a lovely sunny morning, according to the Master at Arms, William F. Reed. As members of the ship's company on the upper deck were going about their allotted tasks, stripped to the waist and singing happily. Belfast passed under the fourth bridge in the wake of her fellow cruiser, Southampton, which was flying the flag of Vice Admiral Sir George Edward Collins, commanding the 2nd Cruiser Squadron. The tug crewman was with them to tow a target. With the sinking of Royal Oak torpedoed by a U-boat in a supposedly protected harbor on the minds of the crew, they were going to be alert with the Aztec on board. But protection from U-boats came from the two escorting destroyers. Air attack was another threat. A Southampton had been attacked on the 16th and the 1st when the first German aircraft had been brought down over British territory, while Belfast had been delayed due to fog. Her anti-aircraft gun crews were at the ready as well. Something discussed previously on the 19th when Vice Admiral Sir George Edward Collins came on board Belfast was the rumor of magnetic mines, something that will become important. But with lookouts stationed around the ship watching for airplanes and others for torpedo tracks, the ship was ready for the possible threats they thought were coming. Apart from those posts previously mentioned, most of her crew was going about their normal duties, with Captain Scott directing operations and others helping to rig up a microphone to give a running commentary to the crew if an air attack came. The main battery as of yet was unmanned, though they would soon be manned as they were heading off to do gunnery practice. Below decks, the engineers were running two of the four boilers to conserve fuel though if need be, the other two were ready to go. Repair work was going on in the paint store, main naval store, wardroom, wine store, and number six store. So the doors to those compartments had been left open. The other watertight doors had been kept shut to prevent flooding in the event of a sudden attack. The cooks aboard the ship were preparing the main meal of the day, dinner. At 10.30 a.m., Belfast was 800 yards astern of Southampton at a speed of 17 knots. Captain Scott aboard the bridge was following the flagship 
and ordered a course alteration to 295 degrees. Then at 1042, a turn of 115 degrees was ordered, then to 60 degrees at 1053. When this turn was complete, the helm was put amidships so Belfast could settle onto her new course. Even with the precautions Belfast and her crew had taken, things were about to go awry, when suddenly a huge explosion occurred that caused the ship to rise some feet in the air and vibrate violently. According to the gunnery officer, who had a good view of Belfast from his position, saw a column of water 60 feet high abreast the forecastle, and then another one 100 feet high half a second later, causing men on the deck near the explosion to be soaked with water. Below decks, forward in his store, the ship's painter, Henry Stanton, was thrown against the deck above him and hit his head, seriously injuring him. Drawing from the last big gun again, Lavery recounts a report by Midshipman Sims. Suddenly, there was an almighty bang, and the ship shuddered as if being shaken by some giant hand. Standing at the back of the bridge to witness the shoot, the shock knocked me off my feet, and my first reaction was the other cruiser with us somehow hit us rather than the towed target. Others trying to make it through a corridor by the chief petty officer's mess noted the corridor seemed to be crumpled or bent in. In the galley where the cooks were preparing dinner, being close to the explosion, they were flung to the deck. The range caught fire but was quickly extinguished when the fuel supply was cut. In the bakery, bags of flour were stored on the ground and acted as a way to cushion the blow of the explosion, and the two ratings in there were unhurt. However, they were now buried in flour. Captain Scott, as soon as the explosion occurred, ordered that all engines be stopped in an attempt to maneuver the ship back towards Ross Scythe. He then ordered the ship forward with the order half ahead, but there was no power to do so. Thankfully, Belfast still had enough power to steer, and he had her turned onto a course back to Ross Scythe before she came to a complete stop. Belfast wasn't listening to one side, which was the good news. However, they still did not know what caused the explosion, and with recent events, notably the sinking of Royal Oak, the inherent conclusion to make was that Belfast had been torpedoed by a U-boat, which in turn caused the destroyers to circle and begin looking for Belfast's attacker. Crewmen, the tug that had been pulling the target, began making preparations for towing Belfast. A line had been attached by 11.40 a.m., and not even an hour after the explosion, signals were sent out to get more help from the dockyard. A majority of the uninjured sailors headed for the upper decks, not knowing if Belfast was a lost cause or if they were going to save her. It turned out to be a good thing that Belfast wasn't at full action stations yet, because the ammunition supply parties might have been injured if they were at their stations. In any event, most of the ship's boats had been damaged, except the two sea boats which were hung on davits. The emergency life rafts were mostly intact, so a portion of the crew began to get those ready to use, while others soon found duties trying to keep Belfast afloat. Besides the damage to the hull, the next immediate threat to her survival was the lack of power. The men below, except those with flashlights or lights on their helmets, were in the pitch black. Not only that, but the telephones were out of action as well, along with the steam-operated generators, which were unserviceable and the ship's ring main had fractured in many places. A diesel generator was soon functioning, and electrical parties carried out local repairs, and power was restored after about 10 minutes. The medical staff, who were shaken but uninjured by the blast, got to work quickly. The three doctors set up medical stations in different parts of the ship, with the officer's wardroom being turned into a hospital ward. The medical team had to deal with two severe head injuries, others had concussions or fractures in the lower body to which they were given morphine. In all, about 20 officers and men had sustained injuries requiring hospital treatment, with 26 more minor cases, including the captain, who had a small wound on his nose. Some of the injured men, including one P.S. Davies, ignored his fractured dorsal vertebrae to rescue two badly injured men, moving them over a watertight door. To hold themselves over, the crew used the emergency supplies of corned beef and other tinned goods kept near the ship's boats. Later, the men were given a meal of herring and tomato sauce, certainly something that was not popular with the men. But, in terms of saving the ship under the command of the ship's executive officer, Commander James G. Roper, they managed to find the somewhat small hole in the hull, and with the ship's pumps, they kept the water at an acceptable level. Shortly after 1 p.m., the tug Brahmin, joined by the Grangeborn, Oxcar, and Bulger, all joined in towing Belfast back to Ross Scythe, passing the island of Inch Keith at 2.11 p.m. It was soon clear to Captain Scott that Belfast had been damaged by some mine, 
not a torpedo. With no sign of aircraft or submarine contacts from the Aztec on board the cruisers and destroyers, making a torpedo hit unlikely. What Belfast was damaged by was a German magnetic mine, being the first major casualty of the new German weapon. The mine was one of several laid by a U-boat five weeks earlier. There were earlier warning signs as several merchant ships had been damaged by underwater explosions on the eastern coast of Britain. Two days after Belfast had been mined, a lieutenant commander recovered an intact magnetic mine off Shoebury Ness in Essex, making it necessary for the Royal Navy to maintain a large fleet of minesweepers to clear the shipping lanes, as well as every ship to have its magnetic field reduced by degaussing, a process I am certainly not an expert in. Back to Belfast, she was secured by 5 p.m. on the 21st in the lock at the entrance to Rosyth Dockyard, with the wounded being taken off the ship by crane. The only one killed by the explosion was the painter Henry Stanton. Later on, Belfast was taken to Dry Dock, where the damage was examined. The men were to stay in the Dry Dock canteen for the night while the officers stayed on board Belfast. Later, the crew of Belfast were given a week's survivor's leave, and while in Dry Dock, the ship's company was broken up. There was some thought that Belfast might be out of action for an extended period of time. On the 24th of November, the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, told the War Cabinet that he expected the repair of Belfast to take five or six months. In reality, due to the damages she sustained, which were quite serious, she was out of action for a longer period of time. Dr. Norman Freeman in British Cruisers Two Wars and After describes the damage as, her back was broken. Where Lavery writes, the ship was placed in a dry dock in the middle of January, and the water was pumped out to let her rust on blocks. Divers monitored the progress, but it soon became clear that, as the weight of the ship came onto the blocks, there were signs of excessive wearing. The keel was hogged or bent, up to three feet out of line at Station 80, about a third of the way from the bow and under the rear of the bridge. The operation was abandoned, the ship was taken out of the dock, and her gun turrets were removed to reduce weight. She was docked again on blocks fitted with soft caps that would give way to allow for the irregularity. I should also mention that partway through a repair and refit, Belfast was moved to Plymouth as it was more suitable for the work. Due to the damage and upgrades Belfast was to receive, she was not returned to service until August 1942. I hope you all enjoyed this interesting little story about HMS Belfast. It's a redo of a much older video that not a whole lot of you watched, and I needed some time to catch up with other work so please forgive the re-upload. Please remember to like and subscribe as it'll help the channel to grow. And until next time, my friends, good luck this week.